to mark our hundredth show, we thought we'd talk about something very dear to me, Skylab. Yeah, and although we've spoken about this before, this time we're joined by one of the nine astronauts who lived on board the space station back in the 70s, Dr. Joseph Kerwin. Don't forget to get in touch with your thoughts and opinions, which you can do on our social media pages at Space and Things One on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook or via the contact form on our website. And please hit the share button if you'd be so kind. Or if you're new here, why not check out our archives to find some other episodes to listen to. But right now, enjoy episode 100 of the Space and Things Podcast. You're listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. Hi, I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 100 of the Space and Things podcast. And what a journey it's been, pardon the cliche. We've published an episode once a week since we started, and we've covered such an incredible array of topics, and had some absolutely fascinating guests, including over 10 people who have been to space. People who have worked with or for various space agencies and companies, authors, academics, a museum director, and a variety of artists from all backgrounds. It's been amazing. Forgive me for being self-congratulatory, but I think we're doing a pretty good job with this podcast, and I'm really excited about the future. Yes, I think we're just really getting started. It just feels like we're just warming up, you know, (laughs) and all I have to say is I'm very glad you reached out to me, you know, two years ago. I had a feeling from the start, you know, we would vibe pretty well together and I had a feeling it would work out, but uh, I never imagined it would be this awesome. So thank you for reaching out to me and uh, I'm very happy to work with you. It's just been amazing. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Anyway, Emily, we've got a lot planned for today, so I think it's time we crack on. Yes. So I can't think of a better way to celebrate our 100th episode than by having another look at Skylab, my (laughs) favorite program, and something that doesn't get nearly enough coverage. Uh, This time, though, we're going to be speaking to one of the nine astronauts who actually went up there. Uh, We briefly spoke to Dr. Ed Gibson in one of our first episodes as we paid our respects to Skylab 4 Commander Gerald Carr. But in this episode, we're going to be talking to the science pilot from the Skylab 2 mission, Dr. Joseph P. Kerwin. Selected in NASA's fourth astronaut class in June 1965, which was the first class to include scientists rather than just test pilot, although Kerwin is also a pilot, he became a captain in the Navy Medical Corps in July 1958 and was designated a naval flight surgeon in December of that year. He earned his wings at Beeville in Texas in 1962 and has logged a few thousand flying hours. As Emily said, he was the science pilot for the first crewed Skylab mission under the command of Pete Conrad and alongside pilot Paul Weitz. The 28-day mission launched on the 25th of May 1973, becoming the record holder for the most time in space on a single mission. While perhaps the main mission of this flight was to rescue the station after it was damaged during launch, they also performed a number of experiments, and on this mission, there was definitely a focus on medical research. So let's talk Skylab with Dr. Joe Kerwin. You got a hold of my legs, Joe? Yeah, one of them, one of them, good. All right, so welcome, uh, Dr. Joe Kerwin, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, This is really exciting. Uh, We at Space and Things always love a good scene setting question. So what spurred the creation of Skylab and and focused its studies in in medicine, Earth observation and uh, solar physics? Yes, I could spend about half the hour on that. (laughs) What happened is NASA grew from a small thing to a very big thing with the Apollo program. But the managers knew all the time that if they were successful, in the moon landing program, there'd have to be some follow-on investigations and flights and explorations and stuff to continue growing and learning. The other aspect of that was that the trip to space included effects on humans that the doctors had no idea really about. There was some uh, some bed rest and other studies done on the ground, but uh, they weren't very acceptable and. And there, was a, there were a lot of questions that didn't have answers. 
And you know scientists, they want to do experiments. But there wasn't time in this program for them to do proper experiments. They could examine the crewmen carefully before flight and after flight. But that was about it. They could adorn them with uh, electrodes and measure their heart rate and respiration. That was okay. But that was it. And those aren't really experiments if you're into the life sciences. So NASA kept saying, okay, as soon as this program is over, we'll do something for you, life scientists, and you will get all the answers you need. And they saved up their energy. And along about 1965, the managers at NASA sat down and said, okay, let's get serious about what we're going to do after Apollo. And, you know, to make a long story short, I was not at the meeting. I had just joined. <laughs> the answer was, we'll do a space station. And it turned out that Werner von Braun, our uh, excellent expert in uh, space flight from Germany, had uh, for a long time thought about the future of, uh, of space flight. And uh, he had published on it. He had uh, uh, made re made recordings and, and everything. And his idea was that first we just get up and back and uh, iron out those problems. Then we would launch a space station into Earth orbit and we could use it to do the experiments that were necessary to see how the man responded. Uh, sometimes I use the word man instead of person, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> And, and how the equipment needed to work in weightlessness and, and all of that. And when we were done with that, we'd go to the moon. And he figured we'd be ready to go to the moon by about the year 2000. Yeah. Well, here it was, 1961. And uh, we had just been told by President Kennedy that we had to go to the moon. Uh, so the next obvious plan was to go back and do that space station and get us on the way to what Ronald Reagan in the future called the permanent presence of man in space. We needed to know if we could homestead up there, if, uh, if we could live and work effectively for long durations. That's what gave birth to Skylab. And the second question was, you know, they're going to cut our budget once the Apollo program is, is done. How can we do the space station relatively on the cheap? And the answer to that was, we will use just about all the hardware that we have and in are inventing for the Apollo program, we'll, we'll use it to do the space station program. We can't use the lunar module. We can use the command service module to get there and back. And we can use the upper stage of a big Saturn V booster, the S-4B, to uh, put our space station in. And then when we get a Saturn V to fly, We'll outfit it with everything we need to do the experiments and to do the living and all and all and all. And uh, it'll be there. We just have to launch it on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, we'll launch the crew up there to dock to it and we'll be in business. So we now know that legs shrink and faces get puffy, spines elongate and bone mass and blood cells change. But were your expectation of what would happen physically in space different pre versus post flight? Well, it was pretty much a blank uh, screen on which to paint what you thought. And like I said, there there had been a little thinking and a lot of in a lot of uh, ground based experiments done. I will give you an example. One of the questions raised by the life scientists was: Would digestion be normal in weightlessness if there wasn't gravity to sort of help the process of eating and digesting and eliminating along? They said, well, we don't know the answer, but let's see if we can find out a little bit. So they had some airplanes that, as you know, you could launch and make them go as fast as you can and then do a parabola. And at the top of the parabola, you pull the nose up and then you let it float over the top. And you can float that thing for about 45 seconds to a minute before you have to pull up again. That's weightlessness. It's very short duration weightlessness, but it is weightlessness. So they did an experiment. They got this medical technician who was not a pilot, and they said, you can be our test subject, and we're going to fit you up with the appropriate stuff, and we're going to find out if you can urinate in weightlessness. 
So they got this poor guy in his flight suit and his helmet, you know, and everything. <laughs> they launched and they went to 35,000 feet and they got very fast and they pulled up. And then the pilot said to the subject, now. And the subject couldn't go. He was too <laughs> tense and excited. And he couldn't He couldn't urinate, okay? So they brought him back down and they wrote a serious paper and got it published in a serious journal that said there were going to be serious problems in weightlessness because the people are going to find it hard to go to the bathroom. The more sober people just said, you know, probably uh, there are going to be long-term effects on the bones that will shrink and uh, and get uh, lightweight and, and weak from disuse. There will be much sooner effects. First of all, on your balance and vestibular system, you'll probably get sick like, like you do going on a boat, but for different reasons. And you'll probably get weak in your muscles. And But we don't know how fast all these things will happen. And there might be other things too. So it was with a certain amount of trepidation that the uh, uh, scientists watched as the Apollo program progressed. Uh, right from the start in Mercury, uh, they were interested and, of course, examined these astronauts very carefully on return from the suborbital flights and then the one-day flights. And so far, they were coming back dehydrated and having lost weight, three or four pounds maybe even on, on a day-long flight, but nothing much besides that, a little shaky. On the longer flights as they went into the Apollo program and started flying, the rule they had for increasing duration was you can double it. If you don't have big problems in one day, you can go two days. Well, they went three, actually. If you, your three days turns out, okay, you can go six. And then you'd roughly double it again. And we had a two-week mission in Gemini 7, I think it was, with no particular results except that the two guys got kind of smelly and a little bit <laughs> tired of one another's conversation up there <laughs> in a spacecraft about the size of the front seat of a Volkswagen. But uh, they made it down and they were a little weak and they again had lost weight and so on and so forth, but nothing to write home about. And they were ready to go to the moon. That's as far as we had gotten. And the doctors still wanted a lot of much better information. So Skylab was, uh, was uh, built to fly for a month, roughly. We went for 28 days, just double that 14-day flight that we had. If we did the 28-day flight successfully, we'd go to 56 days. We'd double it one more time and have essentially a, a two-month exposure to flight. And the third Skylab will be about that long as well. But it'll also give us an opportunity on those flights to do a lot of medical investigations. We had a treadmill, we had a lower body negative pressure device. We drew blood and saved it and brought it back. And we had a, a really, really good and effective suite of medical experiments to do on Skylab to get the first answers. And obviously, it was the main objective of Skylab was to find out and present to the government a statement. You can or we're not sure about going three-month flights and building a space station. Can we build a space station or not? That's what we set out to, to explore. This kind of touches on the last question, but, you know, you've touched on the fact that, you know, during the time that Skylab was being developed, you know, all we had was that 14-day Gemini 7 mission. You know, nobody really knew for sure what long-duration uh, spaceflight was going to do to the human body. So how did you train, you know, as a, as a doctor to uh, anticipate any physical issues during that 28 days in space, which at the time was a huge record? Mm -hmm. Well, we did ground-based sessions of all the experiments we were going to do in flight. We got in the lower body negative pressure tank. And what they do is they just wrap a seal around your waist and then lower the pressure on the lower half of your body, which pulls the blood down into your legs if you use enough negative pressure. And it's a kind of simulation of gravity in a, and that can be used in a microgravity environment. So we did the ground-based stuff, which was boring, no real results at all. We did the, uh, the bicycles to get to levels that were exercise levels, low, medium, and high. And then uh, we'd see how that went during flight. Uh, we drew the blood. 
and we did the other experiments uh, in uh, in balance with the rotating chair. That was all pretty interesting. Uh, <laughs> it was very interesting. They'd put you on there and have you tilt your head in all directions until you were nauseated. And we said, listen, let's talk about this. Getting nauseated is a little too far because <laughs> if you overshoot just a bit, you're going to throw up. You don't want to do that in weightlessness. So, Dr. Gray Beal, will you back off a little? And he did. He backed off to malaise. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, I don't feel good, but I'm not nauseated yet. And he he allowed us on the first flight to exclude the commander, Pete Conrad, from that particular part of the experiment. And I'm getting too detailed. No, this is great. This is great. Keep going. <laughs> it is space. And we started adapting. And there was on our crew uh, very little uh, space motion sickness, uh, just a little malaise. Uh, in fact, we pressed right on. And it wasn't until, in my case, until day seven that I woke up saying, gee, I really feel good this morning, that, which <laughs> means I didn't feel super good before that. Okay? <laughs> we started doing the experiments. Lower body negative pressure produced at first some symptoms of lightheadedness and a little drop in blood pressure. So we could see we were having the gravity effect. And that's good. The hard thing was the uh, was the bicycle ergometer. We had designed a nice ergometer and a very complicated restraint that would keep our body firmly on the seat of the bike in, in weightlessness. Uh, there were straps around your shoulder and there were straps from your waist that went down to uh, hooks on the floor that so they could tighten everything down. And when we found that when we started riding a bike all tightened down like that, the straps dug into our thighs. You couldn't float up and, you know, as you would if you're riding a bike fast. It just made your legs hurt and it made it impossible for us to get to our high levels of exercise. And the heart rates were going. And for reasons which I may get into later, uh, Pete Conrad was especially anxious to show that we could do it properly in space. And uh, he started dropping a couple of premature ventricular contractions, a little, you know, a few, a little irregular. This is not uncommon in heavy exercise, in particular when you're coming back down. But we had the background that we didn't know anything about spaceflight, really. And we had the other background that about a couple of months before we launched, I don't remember the exact interval, the Russians had a vehicle in space for about 25 days, which was the record at that time. And on the way home, they lost contact with the spacecraft. And when it landed, they were all dead. And you can't believe the trouble that some scientists in America made about that. You've got to stop Skylab. You've got to stop it. You're going to kill Americans. And <clears throat> we need to back up and do a whole program of experiments starting at seven days all over again and working our way up, blah, blah, blah. We, the crew, <clears throat> and the flight surgeons, and a lot of the management thought this was pretty dumb. And we thought that we had enough experience and enough testing going on in orbit and enough safety procedures that we could continue Skylab, but we had to go testify to Congress about it, for heaven's sake. Wow. So that all passed over. <clears throat> but it made the flight surgeons, uh, when we launched, very nervous. <clears throat> and when they saw the PVCs and heard that we couldn't get to our maximum exercise levels, and this is only six, seven days after launch, they started to tighten things down. Now, of course, we had launched in trouble. When Skylab went up, it uh, lost the heat shield that was over the workshop. It lost one of the two big solar panels that were our electrical power source. The other one was stuck down. So we had a lot of work to do, and we were going to have to do at least one spacewalk, and we knew that. But the doctor said, no spacewalks for Conrad and no more exercise unless it's over the United States so that we can watch his sensors continuously all the time. And that's what we need to do right now because we're nervous. And so Pete, being a shrinking violet, <laughs> called for the uh, 
uh, a private conversation with the center director, Chris Kraft, who was an old flight director himself and a no-nonsense kind of a guy. And he, with my <laughs> backing, carefully explained what the problem was. And as a matter of fact, just about that time, P.J. White's had discovered that the cure for the bicycle problem was to take that complicated harness and stow it back in the locker where it came from <laughs> and put some towels on the ceiling to bump your head against and just ride the bike bent over. <clears throat> it worked great. So when he told all that to uh, Chris, Chris said, I'll take care of it. And he turned <laughs> the flight surgeons around and we got to do that spacewalk. <laughs> That's incredible. So I'm going to change focus a bit and discuss observing solar flares in real time for the first time from what I believe. The images of the sun taken by Skylab are still really mind-blowing to this day. Tell us a little bit about how Skylab advanced the field of solar physics. Okay. One of the things that they managed to do to increase the overall value of Skylab to make it not just medical experiments was to attach to it a lunar module upper stage filled with telescopes and cameras to study the sun. This had been planned as a separate launch, but it was discovered that you could put the lunar module upper stage, attach it to the upper stage of the, the booster in line so that it was okay for launch. And then you'd cycle it out to 90 degrees and uh, have the crew monitor and perform all those experiments. We had very careful timelines and a very detailed checklists to do everything. And a lot of good cameras in them. And they trained us up as best they could. None of us were uh, solar physicists. There was some question about whether certain experiments ought to be tried as we got down close to launch. And I loved the reply from one of the principal investigators whose name I have forgotten. He said, look, this crew is going to be there. We have trained them well. They are satisfactory. And we need to let them know that we have a lot of confidence in them and that everything they do will be correct. And everybody else said, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we got there and yeah, we made a few minor mistakes, but a, a big breakthrough came about day 23, I think it was. Paul White's happened to be at the controls for that. And we were doing something else. And he shouted down, we got a flare, we got a flare. And the other two of us came up just to watch the screens and, uh, and things as he was flipping switches and turning on the high-speed cameras and all that. It was a big deal. If you did the flare protocol and it wasn't a flare, you just wasted a lot of film. But this was a flare. It wasn't a huge flare because we were in solar minimum. But it was a genuine good flare, and it sort of made the mission for us. Part of our day, almost every day of that mission was for somebody to be at the uh, ATM panel doing solar physics. There was another zero-G uh, lesson. We had a nice chair uh, that we developed and uh, put in front of the, uh, the ATM panel. And we discovered in about a day and a half that you didn't need a chair at zero-G. <laughs> you just needed some place to fasten your feet and you'd be fine. And the chair was put away and never used again. Well, Dr. Curran, why were you the only crew member who didn't swear when the first docking attempt failed? Because I was too stupid to realize the serious implications of our trouble. So what was it like having Pete Conrad, whose motto was famously, if you cannot be good, then be colourful, as your commander on this mission? Pete was both good and colourful. No doubt about that. And uh, we were an all-Navy crew, and we got along great. And uh, 28 days is not long enough to get cabin fever, uh, yeah. even, even though, you know, even if you're, you're isolated a lot. So we, we got along very well as a, as a crew. Even in, in retrospect, here 49 years later, we were very lucky in Skylab that two of the three Apollo 12 astronauts who put their feet on lunar soil, wanted to stick around in the program and fly this long duration mission and give us the benefit of their skill and their experience and their attitude. Mm. Most of the Apollo crews, for, for very good reasons, uh, didn't fly again after those moon landing missions. But Pete and Al Bean did fly again. And Pete was the skipper of the first flight, Al Bean of the second flight. 
and we gained a lot. Why was Pete motivated to hang around and do 28 days? And he told me more than once <laughs> that he was one of the candidates for the original group of astronauts, okay, along with Shepard and Slayton and those guys. And uh, when he was examined by the surgeon, he was given a rectal examination, which in his opinion was very crude and painful and unnecessarily so. And so that day he uh, went to the bar and saw that guy at the bar and uh, sort of gave him a little dressing down like only <laughs> Pete could do. Consequently, at the end of the week, he was not one of the seven selectees. His report was that he was physically and psychologically unfit for long duration space flight. He would spit that out to me and he said, I'm going to show those SOBs that I am perfectly qualified for long duration space flight. So he not only volunteered to stay for Skylab, but he stayed motivated for the whole flight. He was always our leader. He was always doing the most exercise and working the hardest. And, after, and even after we splashed down on the water, the protocol was for spacecraft to get lifted up with a crane and landed on the uh, on the carrier deck. Then they would open the hatch, and then the flight surgeon would, would step into the spacecraft and check everybody out. Only then would we be allowed to leave our couches. And, and they were prepared to carry us off if they needed to, but Pete was having none of that. <laughs> According to his plan, we were all ready. And when the hatch opened, Pete was out of it like a shot, standing up there and walking away, and, and the rest of us followed, and we walked across that deck. Yes, feeling well, like we weighed 400 pounds, but that was okay. That was Pete. And PJ was just really a stable, jovial kind of guy, very talented, who got along beautifully. And uh, if uh, we ever got a little sideways with Pete, he'd say, hang on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back a little bit further in, into your career, you were selected in the fourth group of astronauts in 1965, in which was the first scientist astronauts alongside Moonwalker Harrison Smith and fellow Skylab residents Owen Garriott and Ed Gibson. Upon your selection, was there any pushback from the earlier astronauts or were they happy to have you there? And did you and the others in your group feel like you had to prove anything to those test pilots? Nobody really understood what scientist astronauts were supposed to do when we were selected. They just knew that the National Academy of Sciences, about that time, with the first successes in the program uh, in, in Mercury, said, okay, it's time for NASA to select some people with scientific backgrounds because we're going to proceed and do experiments and we want them to be done by experts. So NASA willingly agreed because uh, the, the backing of the National Academy of Sciences was important to them politically. And they went about with the National Academy's assistance, listing the disciplines in which acceptable scientists could be found. Among them were geology and physics and life sciences, and then selecting individuals who would, uh, who would meet those and also meet the physical standards for uh, spaceflight. And when we got there, here we were, and we had advanced degrees, but nobody was quite sure what to do with us. <laughs> and uh, Deke Slayton and Al Shepard were quite sure, with one possible exception, we weren't going to fly on Apollo because they didn't need that kind of scientist to, uh, to land on the moon. The exception was Jack Schmidt, and uh, he was a terrific asset to the last Apollo flight. He never stopped talking the whole time he was up there. And he was <laughs> accurately describing the lunar soil and the rocks and everything, you know, helping with the collection of samples. Jake did a great job. For the rest of us, we just plunged in. For me as a doctor, it was easy to plunge in because there were problems that doctors knew something about, like acceleration and weight loss and hypoxia and what the atmosphere ought to be and so on and so on. There were, so there was a lot of things I could do and be helpful and a lot of testing I could do. And they made me test spacesuits for a couple of years. That was great. I so I ended up with four Apollo spacesuits with my size, you know. <laughs> then they got me into testing the uh, the being on the 
groups of three astronauts that would do ground tests on the Apollo spacecraft, the command service module in the vacuum chamber. We did the first one. I was on the crew. I was not in, in charge of it. And it was a terrible spacecraft. It was Apollo, uh, it was spacecraft 008, identical to the Apollo 1 spacecraft. We launched in 100% oxygen. They launched in 100% oxygen and paid with their lives for it right there on the pad. The second spacecraft was the, uh, the one built after all the changes were made. And it was a beauty. Everything worked. So I had those experiences. The other guys, one of them uh, was a, a, a physicist from Rice University, really good guy, Air Force guy, uh, pilot. Uh, but his notion, and, and you know, we hadn't been given a, a different notion. His notion was that he would continue to do physics until they found him a flight where he could go and do physics in space. And he didn't want to spend a lot of time at NASA contributing in the way I could contribute just based on my background to the development flights. Pretty soon he came to a, a, a sort of a break point with NASA and left the program. That left um, Jack Schmidt, who was working like mad with the geologists, and Owen Garriott and Ed Gibson, who were helping out as best they could as well. And, the, and so the three of us, Gibson and Garriott and me, uh, were found suitable to uh, be scientists on these pretty much all-purpose Skylab flights. I guess I didn't answer your basic question, which was how did the astronauts get along with us? And that depended. I mean, nobody was against us, but they didn't know any more than we did what they uh, what we were going to do. And they didn't really see us as competing for those lunar landing spots, except for Jack. So we were fine. I remember going to the first Monday morning, 8 o'clock pilots meeting they held every week after I came on board. And Al Shepard was up there in the front telling stuff. And he said, well, we've uh, hired these uh, scientist astronauts, and some of them are off learning how to fly. But uh, here's Joe Kerwin in the, in the back. Al said, they're going to let us pick another set of, of, uh, of crew members next year. And uh, Dick Gordon said, are they going to be scientists or pilots? And uh, Al said, well, I heard, certainly hope they'll be pilots. <laughs> <laughs> And then a little later in the in the uh, half hour, he said, "Now we uh, we'll be picking crews for the uh, I forget which ones the Gemini five and six missions now to start training. Anybody want one?" And I raised my hand. He said, "Put your hand down, Kerwin," <laughs> <laughs> with a smile. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so it was friendly. The only there were only a couple of guys who actually dropped into my office in the next few months to say hello and could they help. And, uh, the fact that one of them was uh, the, f the first man to land on the moon is something I will not forget. It was friendly. There was lots to do. And the entire experience from beginning to end was just a lot of fun. Good place to be, good place to work. So we've had a question from one of our uh, Patreon subscribers. Uh, Richard Jurek has asked, uh, for Skylab, I understand that the astronauts selected several books and or extra music cassettes to take with for off work entertainment time. Uh, did you take anything special with you? And what was your favorite? Each person had their own selections of music on tape. And I, I picked mostly classical stuff because that's what I like to listen to. But I picked some songs from around the world just for fun. And I never did make any public, you know, account of those. Uh, as far as the books I had, uh, a History of the United States by Cecil Chesterton, uh, a book of poems by Hilaire Belloc, and something else, a, a thriller, but I can't remember which one it was, <laughs> by Helen McInnes, one of my favorite authors. And what and the other guys picked whatever they liked the best. So we heard different music around, depending on uh, pretty much who was, who was at the ATM doing solar physics, because you could hang your... Uh, cassette recorder up there and just play while you work. So I'm guessing you guys heard a lot of country then? <laughs> a little country from Pete. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> amazing. And finally, thank you so much for being here, Dr. Cohen. This has been amazing. But finally, what do you think is the legacy of Skylab? Okay. Skylab tends to get left out of, of a lot of the uh, uh, discussion of the early days. 
but we are quite content as crew <laughs> members and as members of the team that Skylab was successful because at the end of the three flights, we were able with the data to tell NASA headquarters, it's okay to start a space station program. You can go for three months. You can do complicated science. Uh, and we have proven that that's true. Uh, right now, the score is man three, space nothing, but it's a little early in the game. Oh, gosh, that was so freaking <laughs> cool. Ah! Okay. Woo. I've never interviewed a Dr. Kerwin. Haven't you? No, I've never had, but I met him years ago and I, I we talked for like 30 minutes and, you know, of course he's very friendly and stuff like that. But one of my goals, secret goals was to like interview him because he's the first U.S. doctor in space. I mean, that's a big, of course. yeah, that's a big yeah. deal. You know, not, you know, that's not something everybody can claim, <laughs> you know, there's only one first. You know, yeah. and I mean, I feel like a lot of the medical things they learn on Skylab, you know, it was the first time they figured out that, hey, people grow in space, like their spines yeah. get longer. I mean, they didn't know any of this back then, you know, and it's just, yeah, this person is, he's just a legend, you know, although I think he would be very shy to admit that. Oh, yeah, I agree. I think that came across in this interview, especially when he mentioned that little story about Neil Armstrong popping into his office. But I thoroughly enjoyed this interview. I I mean, both of you and I were smiling all the way through. Yeah. My face hurts right now because I've been <laughs> smiling the whole time. There was stuff I, I had no... I Obviously, he would know better than me because he's actually been on Skylab. And, but um, there was stuff he was talking about that I did not know about. Oh, so does that mean that when you were listening, were you thinking about, oh, there could be an article here uh, or this is a topic I've not read about. I'd like to write an article about it, perhaps. I would like to learn more about, and I did not know this. Uh, if anybody else out there knew this, please do not lord it over my head. But um, I did not know that Conrad, as a commander, was not allowed to do the um, the spinning chair. The It's called something different, but I did not know that. My guess is probably so he didn't get disoriented. So, you know, if they had to do... In case of emergency. If they had yeah. to get out of there or something like that, you know, so he wasn't not feeling great. He'd be on point so they could get out. I honestly did not know that. I'm sure there are other people who did, but I had no idea. Honestly, I would like to write something about that because I did not know that. And also, I knew there was worry about this, but I didn't know Soyuz 11, which was the mission that Kerwin was discussing where the, the Soviets came back, they opened the hatch, they're all dead. It, it makes sense now that I think about it, but... I didn't know it was such a big deal. Like people were, you know, were like, oh, we can't fly Skylab as it is, you know. And But it makes sense to me now because the Soviets, they were so tight lipped about everything. At first, I'm sure we had no idea what caused it. Yeah. I mean, we didn't know it was depressurization. So it was assumed that, you know, maybe they just couldn't hack space. Yeah. That's another thing that I think is worth investigating because they just didn't know back then yeah there's got to be some amazing paper trails between people at nasa and scientists of conversations had uh, about that and about plans to, to halt it it does make sense that people would have been saying whoa 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 hold on a moment these guys have just died up there and they did 25 days looking back in the mindset of somebody back then it makes sense. There's part of me now that like, oh, why did they freak out? You know, it was depressurization. Well, they didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are two things that, I mean, there's more, but um, <laughs> we'd be here for a few years, you know? <laughs> well, that's the next hundred episodes sorted then. Anyway, for those people who like to see these things, you can watch that full interview unedited uh, on our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash space and things. Also, if you want more from Dr. Kerwin, there's a great book called Homestead in Space, which was written by him, Owen Garriott, and David Hitt. And it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful book. So if you want to learn more about Skylab or have more Dr. Kerwin in your life, read that book. One foot between two of my legs. I'm to see if that works. That hit me right in the head. Okay, since Emily and I last recorded, there have been three launches, two SpaceX launches, one in Florida and one in California, and one launch in China by the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation. SpaceX has now reached 32 launches of its Falcon 9 rocket in this calendar year, beating last year's record of 31 launches with five months still to go. Pretty crazy. Wow. The That's Chinese nuts. launch was the second module of the Tiangong space station, the Wenchen 
the Wenchian, that sounds crazy. I'm, I guess I'm saying that wrong, but it's <laughs> <laughs> the Wenchian module. With, uh, and it is now docked to the station with the astronauts who are currently on board. And they have reported that the rendezvous and docking were completely normal. This module is both a science module and an expansion of the living space, which will allow the station to hold as many as six crew members during handovers. A third module is being launched in October. Now, unfortunately, as with the first module, the upper stage of the Long March 5B rocket, which took the module into orbit, is being left to fall back to Earth in an uncontrolled manner, with no one knowing exactly where it might land. Now, the chance of injury from a falling rocket is incredibly small, but this is a big rocket. There are some international standards for how rockets should fall safely, and it's worth pointing out that China aren't the only country or agency who sometimes break these rules. The US Air Force wavered the requirements for 37 of its 66 launches between 2011 and 2018 because they said it was too expensive to replace non-compliant rockets with compliant ones, and NASA wavered the requirements seven times between 2008 and 2018. So while it is right to criticise China for this, it's worth noting that every spaceflying nation needs to work harder to improve the safety of citizens on this planet, both human and non-human. Yes, exactly. And watch out for that falling rocket yeah, yeah. stage. Just heads up. Heads up. Yeah, just a heads up. Um, <laughs> wear a helmet or, or a baseball cap or just something. Something. A hat with a spike on it. The big news of the last week broke the day after we recorded last week. Uh, NASA has announced three potential launch dates for the Artemis 1 rocket, uh, August 29th, September 2nd, and September 5th. Uh, these dates are pending repairs and tweaks. As we know full well with Floridian launches, uh, there are many other factors which could delay the launch. Uh, NASA has said that they will actually commit to a, a date one week before the launch, though, so maybe we shouldn't have our hopes, <laughs> hopes up too high here and, and start booking hotels. I don't know. And if you can get a hotel, good luck. NASA <laughs> describes Artemis 1 as the first in its series of increasingly complex missions that will enable human exploration to the moon and Mars. It includes the Space Launch System, SLS rocket, paired with the Orion capsule on top. When it launches, it will be the most powerful rocket ever launched, but there won't be a crew on board Orion this time out. Uh, the mission should last for approximately 25 days as the spacecraft travels to the moon and back to fully test out all the systems on board. Now, if all goes well, Artemis 2 is expected to fly in approximately May 2024 <laughs> with a crew on board, uh, which will pave the way for the first crewed lunar landing of the program sometime in 2025 on Artemis 3. Obviously, we've seen many delays for this program so far. So we can only hope that this is what actually happened. Still, it's going to be very exciting to see that rocket take off this year. And I I'm planning to be in town to watch. Yeah, I think I would too. If I was around, that would be definitely something I'd want to go and see. It's just so hard to make plans, isn't it? When the date's so vague and there's been so many other delays with this. It's hard to say what exact day it's going to happen. So it's like, you know, I'm sort of like, uh... Uh, hopefully my <laughs> hey Celeste, just how y'all doing? Yeah, I'm gonna <laughs> figure out that I'm not at home. You know. <laughs> well, if they'd been really nice, they could have figured out getting a payload on board, and then you could have yeah. covered it for work, <laughs> right? That would have been the ideal scenario. I, I still want them to shoot my DNA where that rocket is on the moon, <laughs> the one that nobody knows what the hell it is. I want that. I'm gonna talk to my boss tomorrow. <laughs> Make it happen. Yeah, make it happen. Clear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, on the International Space Station, Oleg Artemyev and Samantha Cristoforetti completed a seven-hour spacewalk outside the station on Thursday, the 21st of July. It was the first time in nearly 25 years that a European has participated in a Russian-operated spacewalk. They configured a new robotic arm for the Russian segment of the station and hand-deployed a series of small satellites. It was the sixth spacewalk of this year at the International Space Station and the 251st supporting the assembly, upgrade and maintenance of the International Space Station since 1998. However, we literally had some breaking news just before we came on and recorded this. So this is probably not the best reporting we've ever done. But 
We talked last week about the head of the Russian space agency, Roscosmos, Yuri Borisov, and today he has announced that Russia will be pulling out of the ISS after 2024. It's currently unclear what this means or whether it will actually happen. NASA astronaut Jell Lindrum, who is currently on board the ISS, was asked about this today during a conference, and he said, this is very recent news, and so we haven't heard anything official of course, you know we are trained to do a mission up here, and that mission is one that requires the whole crew, and so we will continue to work every day to conduct science and research that we've been trained to conduct. The station is due to be decommissioned at the end of this decade, so it'll be interesting to see what happens here. Yeah, I'm just going to discuss this for a second before I, I get to the next news story, but... I honestly think this is sort of like when your schoolyard bully says, hey, I'm going to beat you up, and they just <laughs> never be they never beat you up. They just say they're going to beat you up. It's all talk. Exactly. I think I honestly believe this is the same thing, but we'll see. We shall see. Now, before this breaking news story, I actually wanted to talk to you about this hand-releasing satellite thing, because I think that's amazing. I know it's not the first time they've done it. I know this happens quite a lot up there, but imagine having a small satellite in your hands and letting it go, and you're traveling fast enough relatively that that satellite will remain in orbit. It's a, it's crazy, isn't it? I want to do that. I want to yeah, do exactly. that. I know. Can I go? Can I do this? I will just be the satellite releaser. Like yeah. That's all I want to do is just stand outside the hatch in a spacesuit and just they can hand me them and I'll just release them. That's Sounds what like I want to do. a good job, do. doesn't it? I think it's <laughs> right? amazing. I really do. Yeah, I want to put that on my, my resume. Like, that's so cool. Elsewhere, uh, Blue Origin have announced the six-person crew for their next suborbital launch of their new Shepard rocket, and it includes the first Egyptian and Portuguese astronauts. And finally, the big news at Comic-Con in San Diego, it was announced that For All Mankind has been given clearance for a fourth season on Apple TV. And with just three episodes of season three left to air, it's impossible to know which of the current characters will still be alive for that season? Uh, it's It really is. Uh, it's building to an incredibly dramatic ending, a, as we expected it might. Yeah, absolutely. It really is. Got, that's the place to work, but you're still behind it. You can just come over it right there, behind it, and in front of it again. That's it for this week. 100 shows. Your support in what we do makes it even more fun for us. I would probably still be doing this if no one was listening. But the fact that so many of you are and continue to share the podcast with your friends and some of you support us financially, it's really quite overwhelming and wonderful. So thank you all so much. Uh, I'm currently writing up a hit list for guests I'd like to have on in the next 50 episodes. I'm sure Emily is as well. So if you have anyone that you'd like us to speak to or any ideas, please do let us know. Yes. Uh, and just to echo what Dave said, you know, uh, your support and the fact that you all listen out there and, and you like the show means so much to us. But again, you know, if you have any suggestions, please let us know and we'll try to make it happen. But don't forget, in space, no one can hear you me. Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.